One of our great explorers, Jacques Cousteau, once said, from birth, man carries the weight of gravity on his shoulders. He is bolted to earth, but man has only to sink beneath the surface and he is free. Buoyed by water, he can fly in any direction, up, down, sideways. Underwater, man becomes an archangel. I always sort of felt that the ocean was my natural habitat. It just sort of drew me in further and deeper. The first time I flew down into that deep level and, and began to have a real appreciation for the big picture, it was very exciting. When I was a small child, I used to play in streams and ponds, catching frogs, salamanders, turtles. When I grew up, I found this big pond called an ocean with a lot more fascinating beasts in it. Submersibles allow you to see things scuba divers cannot possibly see. It just completely changed my attitude as to what exists underwater. My first dive was a wonderful experience. And of course, you can't expect what you're going to see. It's all a big surprise. Alvin is a three-person, human-occupied vehicle capable of diving to 4,500 meters, which roughly translates to 14,725 feet in depth. It's used to go out and do deep ocean research. Hi, I'm Mark. Why don't you come on in and check out our submarine? Driving the submarine is extremely easy. We just have one joystick that we drive with. To go forward, you just push it forward go backwards, you pull it back, and to turn, you just twist it. There are three viewports in the submarine. The pilot has his, and each of the scientists have one that they look through. The submersible is electric. It runs on DC voltage. We have two battery tanks. That gives us roughly six to six and a half hours on bottom uh, on a typical dive. Outside of our submarine, we have six video cameras and one still camera and I can switch between all of the channels on this little monitor. And also on this monitor, I can bring up a display for our sonars, so if we're flying in limited visibility, we can be looking out the window as well as watching our sonar at the same time as we drive. The typical dive day starts for the crew uh, somewhere between 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning when they get up and they start that big, long pre-dive checklist. And at that point in time, we sit here and on these tracks, we'll roll the submarine out under the A-frame and get ready to go. All stop. All stop. And then the fun starts. We do a couple more checks while the sub's out on deck. At that point, the three people jump in the submarine that are going. The hatch is sealed. When we're all satisfied, an individual called the launch coordinator is in charge of actually picking the submarine off of the deck with the A-frame putting it over the side, getting it in the water safely. Getting in the sub and diving is an awe-inspiring experience. And you just feel this gentle rocking. And then you realize that you are just completely disconnected from the mothership. You slip beneath the surface and start down. You look, you see sky, and then no sky, just water. In the first 30 feet, you still feel some sensation of movement from the, the basic wave motions of the ocean. But once you've gone more than 30 feet, it becomes perfectly still and calm. 
You'll see the occasional sharks that are, that are often in that environment. Occasionally, a big billfish will go by. A school of dolphins will come. We're only knowledgeable, for the most part, of the top 30 meters of the ocean. That's all we get to see. Once you go deeper than that, you can't see much anymore because it's become very blue and very dark. Once you drop out of that sunlit upper layer, you get into a broad reach that people refer to as the twilight zone. Then you notice it starts getting darker. And that's the first sign that you get that you're actually starting to get deep. It gets colder and colder, quieter and quieter. You get used to the sounds of the submarine. Your rate of descent in the water column is so slow, you're not even aware that you're moving. What you do see are these glass-like transparent creatures that use their transparency as camouflage because this is a world without hiding places. And the only way to be camouflaged is to be transparent. Eventually, it becomes cobalt blue, and then the lights go out. That's when the light show begins. You're looking out the window, and all you see are these stars that go by, which are the bioluminescent organisms. You're starting to see sparks. It's like the sparks that come off a campfire. It's really the only sense that you have that you're sinking, is looking out the viewport and seeing the bioluminescent particles stream past you. I came upon an animal that we know as a siphonophore. Ultimately, it turned out to be 40 meters long. That's longer than a blue whale is. These animals have long tentacles that they hang down below their bodies, and they entangle anything that swims into the tentacles. Tenophores are spectacular organisms to look at. When light hits them, they reflect rainbow color. You might see viper fish. And this is an absolute Christmas tree of a fish. Everything on this fish can light up. Bioluminescence may be the most common form of communication on the planet, and yet we know so little about it. Once you get down below the depth where sunlight penetrates, everything changes dramatically. When you go down into deep water, the most characteristic things are, are the jellies. Everywhere you look, you see these jellies. And, and a lot of the, the luminescence that you see when the sub's lights are turned off are these jellies lighting up. I remember the first time I saw the Dumbo octopus. These have a pair of fins on the sides of their bodies. They flap these fins, and that's why they refer to them as Dumbos. Vampire squids have really, really dark pigment, and in between all of their arms, they have a web. It's an extraordinary animal, about the size of a football, with beautiful blue opalescent eyes. The approach to the bottom is really, in my mind, one of the most wondrous things, because you're, of course, as a scientist who works on organisms that live on the bottom, you're, you're anxious to see them. To see the bottom of the ocean with my own eyes, and it wasn't at all what I expected. The landscape down there is as dramatic as anything in a national park. It just blows you away, because it's so reminiscent of coming down onto a lunar landscape. And there's nothing there. It's just a desert. It looks like a thin mud covering the bottom. All of a sudden, the lights come on. You just hear this click. And all of the bright lights at the submersible come on, and you can see the seafloor. This whole world opens up in front of you. Fish swimming around, and eels, and crustaceans. Here you are, sitting on the bottom of the ocean with two miles of water over your head. And you're sitting amongst a bunch of animals that you'd read about in the literature and you'd hope to get your hands on, and there they are in front of you. Imagine the bottom of the deep, dark ocean, really cold, 
way out offshore. And all of a sudden, a large whale just falls to the bottom. This is a whale that has died. And there is this wonderful feast of food for other organisms on the ocean floor. You've got a 50-foot whale falling down to the bottom, and in two years it's gone? What happened? Who's down there eating it? The first things that come in are the large scavengers, some, some six-gill sharks. There'll be uh, hagfish, these slimy, worm-like fish that have no real jaws, but they just rasp their way through the tissues. Then the crabs come in, and the crabs start ripping and tearing pieces of tissue. And then the very tiny little things, like we call amphipods, which look for all intents and purposes like a miniature shrimp. And they come in by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and just literally sit there and scrape away the tissues until we have very little tissue left but exposed bones. But that's not the end. Those bones themselves are a food source for yet a whole other group of organisms. These whale falls are really phenomenal because organisms will come in and the community structure will change over a period of time and it provides a brand new system or ecosystem for scientists to study in the deep sea. Deep sea exploration is one of the most challenging fields that I know of. It's physically challenging and it's intellectually challenging. It is the most fun I think you can have that's legal. I have to stop and, and remind myself where I am, that I am in a special place that most people don't get to go to, that it's a very privileged thing. We barely scratched the surface in understanding what's going on out there. This is a huge, huge challenge to, to all of humankind. And yet, just a few of us have been lucky enough to be able to enter this habitat and, and to study it. Our own planet is essentially unexplored. We know very, very little about what lives in the open waters of the deep sea. Every time we go down, we see something new that, that we didn't know before. This is the major portion of our biosphere, and we've explored less than 5% of it. What type of resources does the deep ocean have for us? We don't know. It's just an untapped, unexplored place that we should go to and keep going to. One word of advice for the, for the future generation is, is to realize that we do science not because of what we know, but because of what we don't know. And those most exciting discoveries have yet to be made, and you, the future generation, get to make those discoveries.